This episode of the Linux Action Show is brought to you by the good-looking folks at GoDaddy.com. Use our code Linux and save yourself some cash. And welcome to the Linux Action Show, Season 22, nope, Season 23, Episode 2. Numbers are hard. My name is Chris. And my name is Matt. Hey and there, I, Matt. Um here. Yeah. Hey, kind of. Mostly. <laughs> mostly here. You used the first segment to wake up, right? Yes, I did. Yeah, there you go. Well, we have a Ready big show coming up today. We're going to get back to the bash scripts. We got so many bash scripts mm-hmm. sent in that we took a bunch of them in, went over our favorites, threw them all in one big pile, and mm-hmm. then we have enlisted the services of Coda Radio's Michael Dominic. He'll be coming on today's show and picking his top three bash scripts that were sent in. We'll take those three scripts and turn them around so you can vote on them, and then the community will pick the ultimate bash script submitted to submitted to the Linux Action Show. Sounds good to me. Yeah, and then, of course, we're doing the news. We've got some great app picks coming up. And in the uh, latter half of the show, we've got uh, a question I want to pose to the people in regards to remote desktop options. So stay tuned for that. Sweet. But, uh, Matt, before we do all that, why don't I do my Runs Linux pick this week? You know what you should do? You should do your Runs Linux picks this week. Matt, that's a great idea. I think I will. I think I will. Now, uh, everybody's kind of feeling the space vibe Mm -hmm. today, or this week. You know, we had the Mars Curiosity rover. Yeah. What's going on? I love this submission. It came from the Linux Action Show subreddit, and I thought, let's let's do this one. Did you know the SpaceX little uh, spacecraft, the new private spacecraft that can no. go up and dock with your National Space Station and come back down, Matt? That sucker runs Linux. Seriously. That's it does. Nice. It does. It's I like in, it. There's uh, Lawrence Williams of SpaceX. Is uh, This is uh, uh, an executive CEO. Yep, yep. And he's at a and, uh, but, Future yeah. of Commercial Space like Spaceflight Conference, and uh, he talks about the software and the platform that run on the uh, SpaceX rocket, and he mentions in there that Linux and open source are a big part of that. Well, and I think it really comes down to one thing, uh, Chris, uh, No, and when you blue screen in space, no one can hear you scream. That's very true, yeah, because so. of the no oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, very cool. Now, uh, SpaceX is something that Heather and I have followed since, since the very early days on SciByte, and it's mm. been really interesting. What they're trying to do is, you know, we don't have a space shuttle anymore. Right. And uh, we can we can either partner with other nations or we can partner with corporations, and NASA has elected to do that. In fact, they've just awarded a contract to the SpaceX folks to hmm. do a lot of the deliveries up to the International Space Station. Um, so Linux is going to be getting a lot of... Uh, That's real exciting. Yeah. Well, I'm yeah. glad that they've uh, wised up early on. That's good. All right. So uh, let's move on to uh, my uh, Android app pick. But before we do that, and Matt... I, uh, this one might blow your blow your mind. Now, I know you're not always convinced of the Android juju, but I have a, an app pick for you. All right, let's check this out. This is going to be something that, like, uh, that, like uh, preparing Android, my mind to be blown. Android users can show iPhone users and be like, "This is why you want an Android device." All right, that's what my app pick's going to be. But before right. we do that, let's say good morning to GoDaddy.com. Good morning. Good morning, GoDaddy.com. And I hear you have a wonderful offer for the Linux Action Show audience. Yes, that's right, Chris. We do. Thank you for asking about it. Well, you're welcome, GoDaddy. Uh, What is that wonderful offer? Well, Chris, that wonderful offer is 20% off any order at GoDaddy.com. What? Really, Matt? Did you know that? 20% off? Holy smokes. I did not know that. Whoa. Nor did I know that you had uh, the whole personality thing going on. No. That's cool. Whoa. 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 That mic mic is still popping. Is it popping? Yeah, we'll take a look at that Let me pull back a little bit. I think the mic's weird. I know. We'll okay. take a look. Okay. I'll just smack it. You know what, though? It's good because I'm going to save money by shopping at GoDaddy by getting 20% off there when I use the code go 20 off 6 And the great thing is, is you can use that on anything you want. You take that money, that savings, and you get mad a new mic. And everything works out. And Sounds it'll be, good to me. It'll be A-OK. So uh, nice. thank you to GoDaddy for supporting this week's episode of Linux Action Show for years now. And thank you to everyone out there in the audience who takes advantage of our codes like Linux to save 10% off. Or for the month, of, this month only, for the month of, uh, what is it, August, Matt? That's, I think it is August, yes. I do believe me. so. Uh, next month being September. Probably. Yeah. So you can use this code go 20 off 6 while it is the month of August and save yourself 20%. So thank you to GoDaddy. Thank you. For sponsoring this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. All right, Matt. All right. Buckle up. Prepare yourself. I'm this buckled. This is going to blow your mind. The right. Android app pick this week is completely free, and it's called Terminal IDE. Okay. And it sets up, it's just one app installed away, and it sets up a complete development environment, fully capable of doing Java development, HTML, whatever you might want inside mm. this app, including it has tools like SSH, nice. BusyBox, okay. Nano, Vim. I'm, we're talking on your phone, R-Sync. 
uh, Pitch X, all kinds of terminal emulators, a full command line with extended keyboard options, no root access required. It's just an app. It all lives in here. Okay. You can get access okay. to file systems. You can run apps. You can you could actually code if wow. you wanted to. Um, so I guess in theory, if you're willing to get an actual separate keyboard, because I think it would be really difficult to type on the phone, you could just prop your little phone up there and yeah, make things happen. Yeah. You totally could. Or uh, you know, like there's the Asus Transformer Prime, which mm -hmm. you can get with a keyboard option. Oh yeah. Okay. Or you know, like yeah, with the Nexus go. Seven, you pair it with a Bluetooth keyboard. Go up a little bit. Okay. The, yeah. Th I mean, th this has got to be one of it's the coolest apps powerful. I've ever seen. And you get this full console. Yes. You get a bunch wow. of the great apps. Here's here's uh yeah here's an example of a uh, wait no oh they don't have a screenshot of it. Anyways, mm -hmm. they have a very fancy keyboard with a bunch of different symbols on it. Stuff like oh, that. You know, you'd need for like doing code sure. and things like that. I like so, it. So uh, this okay. has got to be one of the most powerful apps. And look. At this uh, rating, an average of 4.8 ratings right here, just That's boom, five pretty stars. Good, actually. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually impressed with that. Uh, the uh, review says here, very nice app. This app is a very powerful tool for anyone who likes to use the terminal. Mm. Uh, it's also you get ASCII, full ASCII colors. You get you know, and you get that in your SSH terminals. I would be interested to know what functionality folks are using the most out of it because it sounds like there's so much to offer. I'm curious as to whether they're yeah. you know yeah. what, what they're relying on the most. That's that's really cool though. I yeah. think that's really well done. I I was really mm. really 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 impressed with it, and really, uh, really. I will put a link to that in the IRC chat room if you're watching live. But if you're not mm. watching live, you can find a link to that in the show, show notes. notes. Okay. All right. My Linux desktop pick this oh, week. Oh, yeah. I now, uh, mm. I, I got a good one. Now, I'm not going to dominate these all the time. You, you, can, you can have picks, too. I, I have occasional ones. I no. have just, I've had a couple of, I've had a string that I've been wanting to get through. Sure. And this one's been on the list uh, since the Ubuntu app development showdown thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll talk more about that in the news segment. But okay. the app that was uh, sort of top pick from that whole thing is definitely my favorite app. Now, Matt, you've got it right there on that computer. I do. So if you click that little uh, light reader icon, Boop. it's the little. There yep. we go. Oh yeah. What you have here uh, for uh, you can minimize that fire. Or there, or that that works too. <laughs> what you have here is a very slick, elegant, and very fast uh, Google Reader integrated RSS client. Hit that little reload down in the bottom left corner. Uh, and I have hundreds of RSS feeds here. With, that, that's uh, good design. He was able to tell me exactly where it is, and I was able to spot it without any. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, that's, like okay. So you see that little uh, forward arrow down there? Kind of looks like something you normally yep. see on a smartphone. Click that. You see, you can send oh. it to Pocket. You can send this article to Instapaper. Instapaper. So if you nice. want to read it later, you can star things here. You can mark them red, and then it syncs back with Google that's Reader. Pretty cool. Uh, this that's uh, pretty is this. There's been some criticism that this is sort of a rip off of uh, a Mac app called Reader. Or or hmm. some re re our uh, reader. I I don't really care if it's a it's no. a knockoff. It's very nice looking. Yeah. You see, so on the left hand column there, uh, it's all my different categories. You can expand oh, yeah. those out. So like yeah, hit like yeah, hit uh, yeah, hit the Microsoft one. Let's or right. open source. Sure. Uh, so you can see there's like some different Microsoft blogs or yeah, hit the open source one. There's different. You can click in there and you see just their articles. Oh and machine's got three new ones. Okay. And it's a little hard to see with the studio lights in here, but there's mm -hmm. actually a very nice like gradient behind, or, or almost oh, like a texture very, behind everything. Yeah. The, the readability is really impressive for most mm -hmm. RSS readers on Linux are pretty uh, lackluster. This is actually quite good. It's very nice. It's light read, and uh, it's available in the mm. uh, Ubuntu store now. It's one of the apps submitted to the development contest. I've been using it for a couple of weeks to, to do my RSS reading. I really, really like it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I have had some stability issues from time to time, but the updates are coming frequently, and uh, you can find PPAs out there to get them. I think I saw somebody say it's, it's going to be submitted to the Arch repos if it's not yet. And also, the fact that you it's adding integration into different like services like Instapaper and Pocket makes it really a nice way so that if you're just reading something on your desktop mm -hmm. and you're like, ah, you know, this is long enough that I think I want to read it on my tablet or my smartphone later on, that little one-click send to Instapaper or Pocket yeah, is, is nice. very nice. And it makes like, oh, this is something I'm going to have to take more time to soak in. Maybe I want to go read it on the couch. It, it's just one click away. So uh, I really like it. It's called Light Read, and uh, we'll have a link to that in the show notes. Uh, and uh, it's coming It's coming along very nicely. Well, two things to consider, again, anytime you're using a Google product, any type of Google relation with your products, mm -hmm. is to uh, two-step, uh, I think it's two-step authentication. Uh, see, yeah, uh, the... security. Um, just suggestion. Make sure that you're actually using a two-step authentication just because you can get a password that's application-specific and if someone steals it, who cares? You're right. You're right. Now, here's the downside. Mm -hmm. I don't believe this app supports two-factor authentication. Then that's going to, yeah, yeah, I'm going to have to. the dev's working yeah. on it. The dev's working okay. on it. Okay. Because right. for me, that's a, I, I, it's how I roll. I know, especially. 
especially what just happened with that uh, Gizmodo wire yeah. mat yeah. Uh, Honan or whatever his name is. I mean that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. An alternative, however, if you're concerned about it, is to set up a separate Google yeah. account that doesn't have critical things attached right. to it, and then you can just do whatever and still use it. The integration with so, Google Reader is both it's it's positive and it's negative because mm. if you don't want to use Google Reader, you're kind of stuck with it. Yeah. If you are cool with using Google Reader, the fact that it is a much nicer UI on top of Google Reader, but keeps everything in sync, so you can use both. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that's really nice about that is there's a lot of other RSS clients that also use Google Reader. So in a yeah. sense, you're keeping all, all of your read and unread stuff in sync across your smartphone and your desktop mm -hmm. and the Google Reader app, which is really kind of nice if you're cool with embracing that. Oh, definitely. So. Yeah, no, I would say that it's, uh, I, I can't see, and the only thing I would say is this, it's just to be security conscious. Other than that, I think it's a great option. And like I said, use a separate Google account in the meantime, no big deal. But don't use your primary. That, that'd be the one thing I'd warn you. Just yeah. with any web app in Google, not a good plan. And uh, you can also use it to, uh, like if you hit listen subscriptions yeah, there. Yeah, let's do that. Um, that. That's just what I call it because I used to use listen on Android. Like hit, like there's, like there's a revision three file there. See if you can open up one of those. Because it'll also, at? you can use this to subscribe to podcasts. Or like there's, twit. yeah, use a Twit one, whatever. Okay, we'll just go. This week this in week Google, Google or something. Yeah, now if you click that, uh, does it let you download the MP3? I haven't used it for podcasts. I am does not. It, like, it would take you to their site where you could download it. It's potentially, po it depends how, the, how they did the enclosure. It should, yeah. I mean, if they did the enclosure properly, it should actually be possible. So it would be right nice if it, if it had enclosure support for podcasts mm -hmm. too, but it'll, it'll list the podcasts, but you won't be able to listen to them. Yeah, but that's okay. There's great podcasting clients. Yeah. Out there. So, all right, cool. Matt. Yeah, we covered them last week. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have, um, I wonder if you saw this. This came through mm. the subreddit, and this sounds like one of the most fascinating Linux distributions we've heard of in years. I did. I actually went and studied up on that. I thought it was a really good pick. Th uh, this is, this yeah, is called this is Bedrock Linux, and uh, check this thing out. Bedrock Linux is sort of a meta distribution in the sense yeah. that you can use it to then run... Fedora, Ubuntu, mm -hmm. Arch, uh, Debian, whatever you want in these different mm -hmm. cherooted containers, all in one distro. And the method methodology behind it is that, basically the reasoning behind it is that so that if you, there's maybe packages and or features that each distribution yeah. offers, you have that option included on one nice like little He uses, uh, there's, this, cool. there's this uh, mathematics app. And oh yeah, he no, says this is cool. it's yeah. only available in Arch's repo and uh, like the mm -hmm. Debian repo or something right. like that. So, but he just goes to whichever whichever package manager has it and mm -hmm. installs it, and he's able to run apps from different distributions because they all live in these rooted and yeah. and and uh, mount binded worlds that they think they're running in their own environment. True. And he's able to say launch VLC from a Fedora install and launch VLC from an Ubuntu install and run them side by side. And and the reason why he says this is better than virtualization is you get raw hardware access. You, you get do. 3D performance. You get all of the kind of, you know, right on the metal stuff and you just pick which you want to run from. And True. That, it's a very that, fascinating it's, idea. It's a very fascinating idea, although I will also give him props for being uh, up very clear from a security point of view in saying that you are, in fact, uh, opening up multiple <laughs> yeah. points of uh, uh, issue, potentially. It's, yeah, so you're, you're, sort be, of, uh, you're sort of vulnerable in every yeah. sense that every other distro that you'd be running is vulnerable. So yeah. if there's a flaw in all of them, yeah. yeah. But now he th points that out, so that's okay. That is true. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the thing that's very hardcore about this uh, distro is, see if I can find it here. If you look at, oh, yeah. yeah. So if you go look at the latest release, Let's just go through the uh, installation instructions. Oh, can, Should we? <laughs> yeah, I think this is. I think this is <laughs> okay, worth it. Yeah, right. Check this out. So, uh, to install Bedrock Linux, uh, you need to prepare your host environment mm -hmm. uh, with a live CD of some other distribution. The live CD is not provided by Bedrock, so yep. uh, Nopix, you know, Ubuntu installer CD, whatever you yep. want. Uh, then bust out your favorite partitioning utility like Gparted or FDisk, mm -hmm. and then he lists out the partitions you need to create. And then you mount and you go into those and you trude into those partitions, sort of like you would do like yeah. when you're doing Linux from scratch or Gentoo, because you actually are doing Linux from scratch. Then he points you over to kernel.org where you go download the Linux kernel source code that you want. Then he points you to busybox.net where you oh, go yeah. get busybox, and then syslinux.org where you go get syslinux, and then you go uh, basically get every single major utility that you need, and then at the end of it, you go get his scripts and it starts putting some of it together um so it's very much a build oh it's a hands-on yeah, yeah and, hands and he says you know if one reason is this is still very advanced and that's sort of this is sort of the elimination contest if you can't make it through this round yeah. then you don't want to be using this distribution uh 
a, a fascinating concept where you could take advantage and sh- pick and choose the different features from the different distributions mm-hmm. you want all at once. So if sure. Arch has something before your other distribution has it, you grab it. Whereas, but if you need something for testing from Fedora, you go mm-hmm. grab that from the Fedora yeah. repo. It's it's got some. Oh, definitely. No, there's applications I could see this being very effective for. Um, and I do like the fact that he has that nice little barrier to entry that it does hopefully eliminate some of the I can't get this to work stuff. He goes in here and he talks about scenarios where. You run an X org from Ubuntu, which is mm. running, which has Firefox coming from the Fedora install, mm-hmm. and you have VLC coming from your Arch install, and they're all cooperating together, and they all think they're installed on straight up Fedora distros. Wow! Or, like if you go, if wow. you go into the Etsy issue file in mm. each distro, it'll say this is Ubuntu, this is Fedora. That's they weird. they have no idea that they're intermingling with each other. That's so bizarre. And it's all just t- using advantage of Cheroots and uh, bound binds uh, and and. Uh, Hmm. Uh, mount binds and all these other like sort of hacky solutions yeah they are but it sounds like they're reasonably compartmentalized as long as you understand the you know where its applications are best suited for and not necessarily for a mainstream environment yeah it's definitely not for a mainstream setup but (laughs) I mean I know this should be common sense for (laughs) advanced (laughs) users but beginners may not know that it's a very cool idea oh I think it's a very awesome idea I I think the fact that it it has some really great applications especially in a testing environment I think it's cool the other thing I would say Mm -hmm. is if you feel like you've reached sort of a plateau with your, you know, like if you feel like you've sort of, I, I've done like a lot of the things I want to do with Linux and I'm yeah. not sure where to go to really learn some of the things. Doing sure, something sure. like this, it would be such a learning experience because not only mm-hmm. would you get fundamental experience with just the very essential buildings of a Linux system. And, right. and it, when you do it like this, you really learn how small and tiny Linux can actually be. And it wouldn't even be so distro specific as going with some of the more advanced oh, distributions. Right. It's actually much more uh, vanilla, much more generic. Yeah, I mean, you're dealing with linuxkernel.org. Yeah. You're, you're dealing with everything from their main sources. So it's very, you know, it's very essential mm-hmm. and basics. And then you do this stuff. You learn these building blocks. And then once okay. you get that built, you then get experience with each distro simultaneously to see how they do things differently. Right. I mean, as far as a, as a a self-training exercise, I think the potential there is huge. Oh, I think it's fantastic. So anyways, Bedrock Linux, we'll have a link to that yeah. in the show notes. Check also, that out. in the show notes are, uh, we have links to all of our previous picks. So you can always uh, go there if you've heard something else on the show before, like an app nice. or a distro pick, you can go find it there. Nice, nice, nice. All right, Matt. Already. Well, let's do the news. So, what's new in the news? Matt, that's a great question. Our top story, because it was voted number one in the subreddit, and I thought, let's go with it. At least it was close to number one. Yeah. Is uh, Debian is now defaulting to the XFCE desktop. I heard about that. I did hear about now, that. Now, this is this is funny because it's that classic reasoning that mm-hmm. is, is almost the go-to reason when any distribution <laughs> does this is, well, we wanted it to fit on the CD. We wanted to fit on the That's CD. That's the official story. Gnome was a little big, so we're yeah. going to switch to... So if you just do the default... So, you know, Debian has, like, these these roles, and you can say, okay, mm-hmm. I want to do a desktop role. And if you just say yep. desktop and you're just generic, XFCE is what you're going to get now. Mm-hmm. It's not like, you know, you can't still get Gnome on Debian or something like that. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, and the only reason I put it here is because it does sort of speak to a larger narrative that's going on. Also mm-hmm. this week, uh, there was uh, kind of a big... Uh, uh, a chuckle over the fact that Unity is now available for Arch, and there's people that actually have it running. Yeah, with Fedora I, I, and OpenSUSE. I just, it, yeah, that's interesting. I, I'm mm. interested to hear the motivation behind that for the people that are doing that. I think that would be cool. I think it all sort of mm. speaks to a larger narrative that I've talked about, and you and I have talked about on the show before in regards to the future of the GNOME desktop. Yes. Uh, so, anyway, there it is. Uh, so, there, there you have it. This is one more piece to that yeah. overall conversation. Uh, I think uh, I think there's uh, probably a lot of people out there that would also agree with this switch. Well, and I think the bigger picture, more so than just uh, GNOME or KDE or anything else, is the fact that they are a, I wouldn't say a minimalist desktop because they're not, but they're definitely more of a do-it-yourself approach than uh, some of the other ones out there. Usually it tends to be the base of a lot of other distributions. So for them to choose more of a... I don't know, a no-frills desktop environment, it, it makes sense, especially with all the uncertainty, frankly, with knowing KDE. Mm. Why not settle on something that they has a has a pretty strong following and isn't so tied into all the other uh, drama? It's, it's the least, yeah, yeah. exactly. It's least dr- drama-ridden choice, yeah. And that's Debian style. They, they're, they're no drama. Actually, uh, next story also kind of seems like we're avoiding what could have potentially been quite a bit mm. of drama around QT. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, there's a company out there called Digia who, uh, if you follow QT closely, you're familiar with them because mm-hmm. they've done other licensing agreements with QT in the past. And uh, they have acquired 
all of Qt now from Nokia. Right. So this is interesting because listen to sort of the language here, Matt. Mm. Uh, following the acquisition, Digia becomes responsible for all Qt activities formally carried out by Nokia. Uh, these include product development as well as commercial and open source licensing and service businesses. Okay. Following the acquisition, Digia plans to quickly enable Qt on Android, mm-hmm. iOS, mm-hmm. and Windows 8 platforms. It's interesting. Hmm. Huh. Since Digia acquired Qt commercial licensing from Nokia in March of 2011, so they've been doing the commercial side of Qt licensing since then already. Okay. They, so they've, okay. Already, they've, they've already had their familiar. feet wet. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, the operation has continued to be successful and has grown substantially. Digia forecasts the acquisition hmm. impact on its 2012 revenue to be positive. In the following years, Digia forecasts Qt business to grow. As part of the transition, a maximum of 125 Qt people from Nokia will transfer to Digia. So 125 people are going keep, to keep, get, get, get to keep their jobs in this transition. Ooh. Well, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's nice. Uh, they're going to be based, ma- uh, based mostly in Norway and Berlin, and mm. uh, the business transaction will significantly strengthen Digi's product and business and supports Digi's strategic objective, strategic objective to grow internationally. Here's why I read all that business. <laughs> I think this is very business, a very business way to say we're really going to focus on QT and make QT yeah. even better than it already is. Because they could have come out with a press release where, like, uh, when Attachment came out and bought Novell, it was a little ambiguous right. at first. That, well, the synergies between open source development and business are really important to us, and we want to support our product platforms. And so services. basically, they were had more of a marketing-driven approach and versus still, the uh, develop more of a developer-driven I mean, uh, approach. Yeah, okay. I won't argue that this isn't also a little marketing-heavy. It's not bad, though. It, I mean, it, yeah. I mean, you know, there, there, you got to have some marketing in there, but I, more, I would be interested to see what they're going to do differently that's going to do what Nokia can. I mean I understand that they've had a lot of successes in the commercial space but well, there, there's think, a there's got to be a glass ceiling someplace well right? I think you know if if you take a business like Digia who can almost afford to just really focus on QT yeah, yeah. whereas Nokia yeah, was, Nokia's got problems so. right and why why would they drive QT anymore now no. that they've sort of hitched their uh, fail wagon to with the Windows phone yeah, yeah, why not when, when in Rome I mean they're already gone so yeah I, so I get guys it. are going to yeah. focus on it yeah, I think so, but I, I am still skeptical just because of the fact that it's, uh, you know, I, I, I and I also really wonder how far it affects and how far reaching and whether or not it's ever going to get beyond the commercial space. Yeah, you know, I, I kind of doubt it. So you know, in the in, in commercial space, they make it work great. I, yeah, I, I best of luck to them. I, I guess the most exciting thing for me out of that whole story would definitely be the fact those folks get to keep the jobs and QT is still going to uh, keep doing its thing. Yeah, so that's cool. It does seem like the most. Positive. Like yeah. I, I, I wouldn't have. I couldn't picture a better company really to pick them up. I'm um, okay with it. Yeah, I'm all right. Yeah, I, I'm not. Yeah, You're I can. Not I can thrilled I'm, I'm not as thrilled. I'm not as thrilled. But you know, <laughs> I, you know, I can live with it. I, I'm comfortable. Skeptical with it. Matt is skeptical. I'm very. Yeah, I'm. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to like come up with my skeptical pose here. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> all I'm, right. I'm a well, cautious. I, I, uh, I, I mentioned Attachmate and Novell, mm, and mm-hmm. it seems like this would be old news. But actually, a recent interview mm. with uh, Attachmate CEO Jeff Hahn has actually revealed some details about what Attachmate plans to do with Novell and SUSE. So, yep. so first of all, we should say they're breaking those two up. Right. Remember, they acquired Which Novell. I agree with. Yeah, I do too. I think that's so, long overdue. So it was a $2.2 billion operating system and network acquisition, as they mm-hmm. call it. Here's when they uh, when uh, ZDNet asked, uh, what's the plan for SUSE's offering? This was mm. uh, Stephen J. Vander Nichols from uh, ZDNet. And he says... Uh, yeah. The CEO's response is, the business structure will change but enable focus, agility, and adaptability required to aggressively pursue the rapid-growing Linux enterprise market. So they're going to focus mm-hmm. on the enterprise. When asked why split Novell, they just, you know, basically they want each product to be able to focus on uh, on what makes them successful. Yeah, which makes sense. I can get behind that. SUSE will once again be headquartered out of Germany. It, it kind of is now. See, it yeah. becomes official again. Right. Um, and... Uh, when asked if uh, Novell uh, slash SUSE will continue its membership in the Open Innovation Network and the Linux Foundation, because some people have worried since that's not a yeah. Tashmate's main focus, they might pull back, because those right. are, you know... That's a big deal. Multi-hundred thousand dollar investments. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, the CEO responded from Attachmate, we will continue our membership in the Open Innovation Network as well as the Linux Foundation. Smart. So they're focusing on... Um, Growing an open source developer base mm-hmm. in areas that will accelerate their enterprise adoption. 
Which is cool. And they're also bringing some purity back to uh, the way things were before uh, the whole... I agree. You yeah. know, I, I like the... I mean, as you said, they're already in Germany, but they're they're really bringing some purity back to that. They're officially back in Germany. They're officially doing their own thing. Um, they're and sticking, they're focused. Yeah, and they're focused. They're sticking with the Linux Foundation. They're sticking... I, so, yeah, I, I, I feel pretty I feel pretty positive about this. And I am skeptical on some things, but this this one I'm, I'm, I'm okay with. And I, I think feel, they... Yeah. I think this is... I think this is like a necessary move mm -hmm. uh, because... The, the whole thing is, is while Red Hat Enterprise Linux is still the dominant enterprise oh, Linux yeah. by, by a good margin, uh, surprisingly, more than people would probably realize, Ubuntu server, in large part thanks to Rackspace and Amazon mm -hmm. EC2, Ubuntu server has seen a large adoption. Mm -hmm. And I yeah, think they've really been eating market share from SUSE Linux Enterprise. And, right, exactly. So they have to adapt and yeah. find new avenues yeah. to uh, make differentiate themselves. Yep, yep. So uh, good luck interesting to times ahead. All right, Matt. The next right. story kind of kicks around what Valve might actually be up to. Mm. So we've had two things come out this week that I think are particularly interesting, mm -hmm. and the blog over at Warpgate 9 did a pretty good job of summarizing both those occurrences. Number one, okay. we saw the official announcement from Valve that Bogus. the Steam store will be selling standard apps as well as games. And we have every reason to believe that'll be available for Linux, too, although I don't know for sure. I think it will. Yeah. I think it will. So, I think they recognize that. Bite that off. What do you think about that? I think that could be a, a positive thing. I know there's been a lot of uh, fear of you know duplication and, and competition between you know like in Ubuntu for instance, the Ubuntu store, you know, a Steam, you know, the whole uh, oh, Steam like store. Oh, like Steam. Yeah. Steam store will be competitive I mean, exactly. Ubuntu. Right. I mean, there's that Software whole thing. Center. But honestly, that hasn't been an issue. I mean, you know, it's like it's like it's long as as long as it's compartmentalized and they're doing their own thing and they're not uh, taking away anything from the uh, current software repositories. Who cares? Well, it doesn't I, you know, it seem like to you that they would be serving two different markets. Like the Steam one would be serving at first, like at first. larger enterprise customers, and the yeah. Ubuntu Software Center is servicing like small, smaller indie devs or the open mm -hmm. source community. And, uh, you know, stuff that is really more well, user-generated. Yeah. In, in their current direction, but that could change over time. They could decide that it's just easier, faster, and they would rather control uh, more of it, um, depending I, on... I, I guess to me also you know, it would seem I, like... I don't know. If you're going to... I mean, if Steam if Steam drives users to Linux, yeah. more users to... Uh, then, exactly. Then that means more sales in both software stores. Oh, yeah. No, I completely agree. And I think it, like, uh, it makes this whole, like, uh, moving a lot easier mm -hmm. now... Let's think. Let's think. A, let's think two, three years down the road. Okay. When Windows 8 okay. has been here for a while, everybody hates it. It's Vista 2.0. <laughs> right. So exactly. people are clinging on to Windows 7 in the sure. enterprise, right? Okay. But Windows 7 is starting to get a little long in the tooth. Sure. Along comes Steam. By the way, Steam now ships uh, all these great desktop apps because we're three years into it at this point. Okay. Everything's right. tied in with Steam Cloud Storage. It's encrypted on your end and then sent, I'm just assuming, mm -hmm. and then sent up to Steam in, in their sort of locker. And so you sit down just like you would sit down with a video game right now. You sit down, it downloads hmm. LibreOffice or whatever they're going to distribute through the store, and then you go file open, and it opens up your Steam Cloud Storage. There's all your Steam docs. You open them right up into Libre. You save. Then you, sit, you go home. You sit down on your Linux box. You do the same exact thing. It loads yeah. the same app. It accesses okay. the same storage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That could be huge for platform. That could adoption. definitely be huge for. I know. I think that's. I think that's definitely a good thing. And well, and as far as like uh, you know, comparing it to Ubuntu Software Center, they copied Linspire CNR. As a matter of fact, they even hired people from Linspire uh, to do that years oh, ago. Oh yeah. I mean, so so I mean, it's not like they did, and they've had all this time to do it, and it's still not really that great. So I think yeah, I think that in the long run, better. it's gotten better, but it's got a ways to go. I I think that Steam. I, I think that Steam would definitely. Overshoot that. Competition would be good too. Yeah, I, I, I think it's going to go that direction. So yeah. uh, here's part two of what came out is uh, the we've all been talking about like this Steam set top box. Oh yes. Well, mm. the patent filing from Valve has come out showing a set top box. Yeah, it looks like uh, we have Lex Luthor sitting there on a chair playing a game. <laughs> uh, it's a. Uh, <laughs> It does look like a, I'm just kinda, saying, and it kind of looks like an Xbox 360 yeah, too. He's, kinda, um, he's being attacked by numbers, but yes, that's uh, it, but it definitely proves the proof of concept. So yeah, yeah. I mean, Steam's uh, so you got Steam, and they're talking about uh, the, the patent talks about a controller with interchangeable parts mm. that include, among other things, a mouse and a keyboards or weapon interchangeable. So it's a mm. console that actually okay. work with a mouse and keyboard. That could be that would be nice. That's uh, actually that would be preferable, right? That would be very cool. Running Linux. Oh yeah. At least if if. Uh, you follow oh, yeah. if you follow yeah. the logic here and all of that so well and it definitely uh, helps them to diversify especially with things shrinking for them on windows and yeah. some un, you know as far as the linux desktop that's great but why not go a step further 
So that's the so, question is, is hmm. are they going to go a step further? Is this why they're working so closely with the hardware partners? Is is this what part of the big grand platform is? Is it maybe going to be a little Ubuntu-based box? They're going to do like a minimal Ubuntu install on in that. Thing? I would say that they're not committed to it, but they are reser- they, they've basically bookmarked it. This is something we would like to do in a perfect world, and we want to reserve. Hence the uh, p- patent application. I disagree. I, 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 th- I, think, I think they. I think they want to bookmark. Oh no! I think they're doing it. And I think you the reason think why so? they're doing it is because when uh, when Gabe was at a conference, he was asked, "What are you here for today?" He said, "We're talking about our ten foot experience UI. Yeah, yeah. Why we're supporting Linux." And gaming on Linux. Those are the three. Oh things yeah, said. yeah. No, definitely. But our, I, t- our ten foot UI, they're already working on it. But it's a lot. It's a, it, but why not get it all out in the on the Linux desktops? Is kind of a is kind of like a bunch of free beta testers. Let let that soften up for a while. Let it stew. Let it steam. Yeah. Then go to the console yeah, versus rushing out the door yeah, and, beco- and becoming you know failware. <laughs> such You're a, right. You know. Plus plus the, anything they did on the desktop, yeah. they could kind of work out some of the bugs there, and then the, then the console could be really exactly. solid. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good. That, point. That's what I would do. Yeah. I'm not saying yeah. I'm an expert. This, but uh, that's I, I bet you're right. I bet so. I mean, that might mean that might mean like no. we don't see a console till 2013. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's. I mean that would. Why not do it properly? And also take the time to really examine what stinks on the existing consoles. Yeah. Where could they really nail this? If they got the timing right, because uh, the main console, the major consoles are kind of old. Right. And yeah, they don't want to wait too long. And they're kind of yeah. looking long in the tooth, but they're mm-hmm. going to be talking about their new yeah. things soon. So right? they got to time it ju- preferably yeah. just before. Because you don't want to go up against awesome. the Xbox yeah. no. 740 or whatever. It's no. 790. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. Some random set of numbers. No, no, no. I, I think PlayStation I think, 420, whatever it's going to be. I, I, I suspect that they're going to. Th- that's why they're doing it the way they're doing it. So that once they know it works on the Linux desktop, they can throw the switch and t- toss it into hardware as soon as they need to and already know what to expect. But they, but they have that freedom of if, waiting. If they they are successful. Mm. They are going to set a new tr- a new trail for other mm-hmm. game development oh, shops yeah. to follow. Oh, definitely. I mean, because the, uh, to me, if it's a, if it's if the hardware is similar in the set top box to a desktop experience, like yeah. a baseline desktop experience, yeah. if you can do eighty percent of your R and D in a desktop ex- environment that's already ready to go that works for developers, that makes it easier because they can get their hands on that right now. Yeah. For testing, mm-hmm. that makes that easier. For Q and A, that makes that easier. I mean, it's so awesome. That's mm-hmm. the kind of flexibility because Linux can work on these big systems all the way down to these little systems. Mm-hmm. Right. That kind of range is awesome for developing projects. Like oh this. yeah. No, I definitely would agree with that. Definitely agree with that. All right, Matt. All right. Let's talk about something I teased a little bit when I mentioned Lightread. Okay. I talked a little bit about that Ubuntu app showdown. I remember this. And I thought this was interesting. We actually covered it uh, when mm-hmm. it was going on because I, I thought this was a great way for a distribution to encourage yeah. people to write new apps for the Linux desktop. And I think this overall was a success. And here yeah, are the I winners. So uh, these are people that uh, put something up. People voted. And mm-hmm. these are some of the favorite apps that were created during this competition. Uh, number one, the gold prize does go to Lightread. That was the uh, desktop app mm-hmm. pick that I made today, and I, I have to completely agree. I would agree with it. Yeah, yeah. it's very attractive. Uh, when uh, The second pick goes to Fogger, which is an app that I gave a demo of a couple mm-hmm. of weeks back. Fogger is a, is a very easy way to take a website and, and create a web browser container for it that runs as its own standalone executable. Like So you uh, can take mm-hmm. Facebook mm-hmm. or Gmail or the JB Livestream and throw it in its own private executable container so you can close your web browser you can restart your web browser you can do whatever you want and that keeps mm-hmm. running it makes one web page you might like even say it's a little bit like prism uh mozilla yep, prism it's exactly yeah. like Prism. yeah same uh, concept fogger is uh very mm-hmm. handy and chrome has some of this functionality as well mm-hmm. but yeah. i like this because it's completely self-contained it's cleaner than most yeah uh, uh, and uh the bronze prize went to pixaw which lets you take any app on your or any photo on your machine and make a jigsaw puzzle out of it mm-hmm. i actually Dylan actually really liked that That's one. cool. Yeah. And uh, all of these are available right now in the Ubuntu Software mm-hmm. Center. Yes. Winners got a uh, a uh, Nokia N9 or whichever. I can't remember. What, what I do not remember. remember. I know I know there was a couple laptops in there, and then there was... Yeah, uh, System76 yeah. got a couple of laptops mm-hmm. away. That was really cool. That was very cool. So, so they, yeah, got, uh, they got a Mego phone, and they got a System76 laptop, and an Ubuntu t-shirt for making those apps. And they're... That's awesome. I think they're going to do this again. Oh, I hope so, because it's definitely getting some really cool applications out there. Definitely. Yeah. And... and um, one of them, I can't remember which one, is already being imported over to other distros. So while yes. they sort of premiered on Ubuntu, it's like, you know, two, three days later, they're they're showing up on other distros. Well, and to answer some of the complaints that I've seen about the contest itself is that, uh, well, actually more than a few people have said, I've really made the charge, hey, you know, this is all about this web, uh, web app stuff. They're, we're not seeing a lot of local stuff, but it, in reality... The Linux stuff is kind of blurring the mo- blurring the lines anyway. You're seeing a lot of uh, yeah. localized integration with web web apps. I so guess that's yeah, okay. It's Fogger, yeah. Fogger is I for mean, web apps, and and Lightread is for G- Google Reader. But 
isn't that kind of yeah what, i mean it, it's kind of where what, everything's going anyway and it is more and it's more cross-platform and it's more cross-distribution it's you know it, exactly it, you know so i don't see a problem with it so people that feel that way you know that's kind of where things are headed so huh yeah you know. you're right it, this, in, as negative as having stuff in the cloud can be with yeah. privacy and security having more functionality cloud-based reduces the requirements that it needs to be able to run on different distributions mm -hmm. yeah so exactly that, hmm. Yeah. Well, and also, and just cloud security 101, don't call your cloud stuff backup a backup. Have localized backups oh, yeah. as well. That's, yeah. you know, people that don't do that it just escape me. So, yeah. Now, we got a little grief. Remember a couple mm. of weeks ago, we were, uh, we were, we were lamenting of the future, possible <laughs> yeah. future of GNOME. And, uh, and we were a little, a little probably lost when they, said, when they announced GNOME OS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of I remember this. Yeah. So we got some details about Gnome OS, and some of this stuff actually kind of seems a little kind of rational to me. It I, does. I'm starting to see there, the logic some, behind Yeah, there's some logic there. Uh, so uh, this has actually, you know, honestly been rumored for a couple of years, and uh, they've had a few ideas kick around. But I think what it really came down to is they wanted to provide a very easy to pick up and install platform mm -hmm. for application developers sure. because Gnome is losing good developers. They all are. The time. Yeah. And if they can l reduce the barrier for people to come on and develop new apps, that's what they're trying to do. Makes sense. Um, yeah. Gosh, it seems like still seems like a quite a bit of work at the end. Of the I, day, you know, I, I, I get the I get the rationale, but at the same time, are you reinventing the wheel here? So they say, you, <laughs> you know, because what yeah. they can say is we can treat this as a here's your GNOME development SDK. Yeah. You can always we can certify that if you can write to this, this is the baseline. We'll you can you can test against well, this, yeah. and that's important, right? Sure. So you can test that this is a good gnome environment, and uh, I, I guess it makes a lot of sense. And, and maybe we'll see. Hmm. We'll see where it where it takes. I, I you know I I'm I'm. I'm I'm skeptical. I think it sounds cool, and I'm I definitely am interested to see where it heads. But I'm not going to get too excited until I actually see some results. The other thing this is so. that gives them a chance to do is implement new design ideas that mm. the other distros might balk at. Like we just saw okay. an announcement that uh, Ubuntu twelve ten may actually ship with an older version of Nautilus that has more functionality than the version than the, what will be the current version when Ubuntu twelve ten ships. Hmm. So they're going to actually okay. go back instead of using Nautilus three six. They're actually looking at using right. Nautilus right. three four right. in Ubuntu. And so what Gnome is saying is, look, we're trying to get these things out here, see what the user adoption is, see what mm -hmm. the use curves look like. But if distros aren't going to be implementing our technology, we have to have an avenue to still have people test That's, and validate this. Yeah, stuff. no, that that I would agree with. Okay, now that for testing and things, I, I can understand that in the development. Yeah, I like I said, I I wish them all the best. I'm just. They've got bigger issues they got to deal with first before they, they really do. This. I mean, we talked, it's kind of horse before the buggy. We talked about Mint is releasing is forking Nautilus and calling it Nemo. Mm. Now you've got I don't know if it's final yet, but you've got uh, Canonical talking about using Nautilus three four because right. it has the extra yeah. pain and a few yeah. other things. It, it, they're really Gnome is really in a in a tough spot. And you know what's funny yeah. is Gnome three six is looking like it's going to be a really great release. It could be, yeah. It it, it really could be. I, like I said, I, it, if they can get it there, and whether or not they can, I, it, the future is just so rocky right now. I, yeah. I per, and, and understand. I prefer uh, GNOME based applications and and a lot of the desktop functionality that comes with it. Although I'm kind of tied to Unity right now, and I'm kind of digging that. But yeah, you know, the, but there's enough because, granular stuff underneath that I, I care about it. But at the same time, the future is a little uh, little spacey. I'm just real real concerned, so I can understand why. What you why, care you know, about is so. GTK. Yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. That's what you care about because that's yeah. what you, you know, if you're using XFCE or Unity. Yeah, because know. the desktop itself, if it, you know, whatever happens to it, as long as GTK is still in place, it's fine. But it, yeah, mm, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, a little, I'm a little concerned about its well-being. I'd like to see it succeed because I like choice, but yeah, mm, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I'm, you know, it's, mm. some, it's, it's maybe not going to be super healthy for a little while, but it, it won't go away. Something will happen. Gnome yeah. is a legend. Yeah. And yeah. it will continue on. Um, all right, well, let's wrap up with our last news story uh, with uh, a, a fun one. This, uh, this is a post that is some of the best oh. SmackDown moments in history. Yeah, I sent this in. Uh, <laughs> did you submit this one? Yeah. Good one. Good one, Matt. Yeah, Good yeah one. that was me. Uh, so uh, I won't... Here, let's see. There's. Uh, oh, here's one. Uh, we're going to have uh, Michael Dominic on from Coder Radio. So let's do a development-related one. Uh, so Linus Slams C++. Here's uh, what he received a comment about his uh, Git source code. Yeah, he said, pure C as opposed to C++. No idea why, but don't talk about portability because it's BS. So then Linus responds, you, 
You are full of... And then he says, <laughs> he says the full thing. C++ is a horrible language. It's made more horrible by the fact that a lot of substandard programmers use it to the point where it's much, much easier to generate a total and utter crap with it. So I'm sorry, <laughs> but for something like Git, where efficiency was a primary objective, the advantages of C++ are just a huge mistake. Yeah. The fact that we also piss off people who cannot see... That it's just a big additional. That's just a big additional advantage. Um, I love that one. I love. Uh, he's, a, he's a little extreme. <laughs> there's one on Linus and the mm. Gnome Devs, but I'll I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll skip yeah, that one. Yeah. Um, Linus makes. Uh, here we go. Let's see. There's a uh, here's a Linus lashes out against the competition. A lot of people <laughs> still like and use Solaris, but I'm in active competition with them, so I hope they die. Short, sweet, to the point. Yeah, that's a good one, right? <laughs> uh, Linus touts the new release of Linux. This is one of those rare, perfect kernels. So if it doesn't happen to compile with your config, or it does compile, but then it uh, then it does un unspeakable acts of perver perversion with your pet, uh, <laughs> you can rest easily knowing that it's all your own damned fault, and you should fix your own evil ways. I love it. You can actually hear his, hear, or see him shaking his fist at clouds. You know? there, there's Great. several, there's several, like, he lashes out against security people. Let's just, this will be the last one. Uh, Linus disparages security people once again. He says, he goes on to say, and again, this was, uh, he says Linus, although he thinks security is important, he wants to make it clear that discussion on bugs, that it's uh, no less important than everything else, it's also just as important. He says, security people are often the black and white kind of people that I just can't stand. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. of the open BSD crowd. It's a bunch of masturbating monkeys in that they just make such a big deal about concentrating on security to the point where they pretty much admit nothing else matters to them. <laughs> masturbating monkeys, man. Yeah, and I've heard uh, <laughs> rivalries going the other direction. It gets a little interesting. There's, uh... We're very lucky that uh, mm. our uh, fearless Linux leader is not... Like uh, shackled by some corporate mm -hmm. PR department or something like that. Uh, it's very clear he's not. No, I know. I love it. <laughs> and I, he's uh, already got it made, so he's good to go. He and can I, say what he wants. I think that's awesome. I really yeah, do. That's uh, good. More power to him. All right. So uh, you can find a link. There's uh, I, I I didn't I only read like three out of the. 15 oh yeah, there's there, so. gold all throughout it. Check it out. It's a good laugh. Now, uh, before we move on to the uh, the best of the bash segment, I want to say thank you to System76 for sponsoring that said yeah, segment. System76, as you guys probably know, makes the best systems that are built to run Linux. They're meant to run Linux, and they sent us one of their very nice rigs, the Wild Dog Performance, which is just a beauty. First of all, the thing runs whisper quiet. Yes, it does. Even when you throw it under a workload, the thing runs... And I have. Whisper. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's very nice machine. So they equipped us with one of these things so we can do all sorts of nasty tricks on the Linux Action Show, and mm -hmm. they keep us going. So thank you to System76 for sponsoring our Best of Bash segment. So what do you say, Matt? Let's go chat with Michael. time to have some fun with bash we've gone through of all of the submissions that were sent in well as many as i could actually round up there were quite a bit sent in and uh i've supplied them in an efficient list sort of one after the other almost like bullet style listed nice. and we've brought on michael dominic from coder radio the newest show on jupiter broadcasting all about the art and business of software development and the related technologies around that michael welcome to the show Thank you, guys, and it's nice to meet you, Matt. Nice to meet you. Now, uh, Michael is uh, audio only because he's a mysterious man, so uh, we have a stand-in picture of him if you're watching the video version. And yes. I should point out, though, I can vouch that Michael is a handsome man. I have seen video of him. But in order to maintain his Coda Radio <laughs> mystique, he'll be uh, filled in by the Hoff. So, All right, Michael, now uh, I know you've got a chance to look at some of these Bash scripts. Do you want to uh, start from the top? What, uh, what was sent in that uh, caught your attention? Sure. First off, they were all very good, and I have to say, every one of them ran, so I was very impressed. <laughs> well, they passed the first test, then. Passed the first test. I didn't have to change them. All right, so just going in order of your list here, mm -hmm. uh, the first one is a, quote, JB Live Show Recorder sent in by, can I say the names or no? Oh, yeah, totally. Okay, sent in by Creepy Uncle in the IRC chat. Yeah. It does exactly what it tells you it does. Uh, one of the nice things, if you actually click on his link... I, his code is formatted really nicely. Yeah, yeah. It also runs pretty quickly. I mean, it's a Bash script, so it's not going to be slow. But, you know, this is something I never would have thought to do in, in Bash, actually record a JB. And, you know, this is, this is one of the scripts that... Uh, right this, from Terminal. Oh, I know. And there this you is... go. And 
I'm pretty sure it's open source and anybody could use it. It's like, a, yeah, he says it has like no license, but this is one I've actually been right. using for the last few days and he's continuing to work on it. Like I changed it so I tightened up the times a little bit because it was starting a half hour before. And now, right now, it's back in my office running and I should be recording the entire live stream of the Linux Action Show using the script. It's very cool. And Creepy Uncle is, this time he added more bacon. Actually, six times more bacon. <laughs> he actually divided. Did you see this? He calls this. This is the. He has a. Uh, he has a comment in here. This is the main function, the meat of the script, and it's bacon is the function. I love it. <laughs> love it. So he's got some style points there. All right, that's a good one, Michael. I think it's pretty good. The next one is a one-line bash HTTP server. Uh, I particularly like this one because he hosted it on GitHub as a gist. Mm-hmm. Yep. Now, if you're familiar with spinning up servers and other scripting languages, you know it's pretty much standard, right? There's no, it's nothing magical, but it does. Oh, boy, we have a we're job. Having, we're having some one Skype problem there, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a bash server that runs on one line, which is awesome. That's extremely cool. I yeah. love that. Or, I, I'm sorry, a web server. Yeah. 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 Bash server. Bash one, server. One line bash HTTP server. All right. Yeah. Nice. So there you go. That was one of your picks. All right. What's the next one? The next one is a podcast script that records to MP3 and AUG and applies some kind of compression. Yeah, so that way the audio is kind of uniform. So this is another one that's actually I like because it's really practical for the JB Live community, right? Yeah. Let's say you don't want to use some kind of big podcasting client. Do it in Bash. Totally. Just run it in the background. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know who sent these last two in. Just run it in the background. There you go. Cyber, Cyber Ghost sent uh, this, this, uh, the MP3 recording one. Nice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Great work, CyberGhost. Very good. And of course, people will have links to this in the show notes. Okay, what's our next one? The next one's a little more serious. Um, this is a script to set up Squid DCHP, or DC, you know what I mean? DHCP? Ad blocking, yep, bind DNS. And this works on CentOS and Fedora. Oh, so like a nice little get a machine ready to roll out kind of uh, script. Yeah, so this is something that's actually, you know, you would probably actually do in Bash in a normal. <laughs> this would be a very practical use of Bash case right yeah yeah absolutely very cool very cool and that was sent in by uh fodder fodder nz i'm gonna say fodder 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 nz fodder Fodder new zealand maybe yeah yeah not sure it's a good one and uh if you have a centos box you want to get rolling that's a script you could look at or at least go look at and modify for your own uses Mm -hmm. okay michael we have another one all right right down the list we have a bash script that's sent to your email every time your public ip address changes Oh, okay. Very handy. I like Again, that. Mm. I like that a lot. Yeah, this was one I might have to commandeer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, what's cool is in the uh, comments, there's also people that give some suggestions and things like that for other things you could do. Uh, uh, yeah, very cool, including some ways to do it in PHP. Nice. That's a good one. All right. What do you got next? Uh, this next one's called, quote, a better prompt dynamically. A better prompt dynamically. Okay. Yes, yeah, so it's a, this one's, a, to be honest, this one I didn't get to run correctly on my Mac, and I don't know why. <gasps> oh. This my Ubuntu Bear box 50, was very busy. It's Bear454 who sent this one in. Yes, but he has a lot of comments that say it works, and it seems to work pretty well. Yeah, this will give you a, this will give you a fancier, uh, fancier bash prompt, right? Mm. Yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, so this is doing. changing your actual bash yep, prompt. Yep, very nice one. Good one. Nice. All like right, that. so where does that leave us? So that leaves us with one left, uh, a pretty classic one for, uh, I would say, Linux users, a bash wallpaper changer. Okay, okay. I can see that being handy. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, this is pretty much standard, right? You run this, and uh, every X amount of time, it will update your background. He says it's only 16 lines long, too. So that's, that's fancy. That's not bad. And he has a little config file where you can go in and you can set things in, uh, in a background changer so you can set your parameters. And he's got it up on GitHub, too. Yes, he does. I should note for anybody trying to run these scripts, uh, they all ran on Ubuntu. The only one I didn't get to test on Ubuntu was uh, that last one that I said didn't ran. Right. The, the prompt changer. I tried it on a Mac and it didn't work, but that makes sense because it's probably written for Linux. All right. So these are all good, Michael, but you can yeah. only pick the top three because that's what we want to put available to vote by the audience. So what do you got? Uh, so I'm a pretty pragmatic guy. So I definitely like that one line HTTP server. <laughs> That's nice. I really like the D, the IP address. Uh, I'll call it the notifier. Yeah, that yeah. is nice too. Okay. Uh, I, I can only pick one more. Yep, only one more. Killing me here. You know what? I have to say, I like Creepy Uncle Show Recorder. Nice. Okay, yeah. so there we go. So we'll put these up to vote. The, uh, the uh, live stream recorder... The uh, script when your email changes, and the, what was the other one? The one-line HTTP server? 
Yes. For fu- for style. Those are going I personally like, of course, Creepy Uncles. Live oh, yeah. Because I've already been using that one. Mm-hmm. So, now, uh, okay, mm-hmm. Michael. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to put these up for vote. A link will be in the show notes. And then at the end of next week's episode, we'll go over the results and award the winner with a special fake prize, which, yeah. I'm, you know, is. I we have know. a lot of those. Yeah. Now, Michael, before we get out of here, one of the topics that's been coming up on Coda Radio recently, I thought this would be a great spot to talk about it if you'd like, is uh, you're looking at developing some of your software for Linux, and uh, I know you've been looking at things like Unity integration and been and looking at uh, what languages to write in and things like that. Do you want to recap some of where you've started and where you're at with some of that? Sure. So um, there, I have an app for Mac called Code Journal, and I wrote that natively in Objective-C, and I want to do a quote, native Linux version. Right. Uh, originally, the idea was to do an Ubuntu-specific version, but I got a lot of outcry that it should run on at least Fedora as well. Hmm. It's a GitHub client, so I could see how that could be pretty yeah. p- applicable to the Fedora audience, yeah. So if you listen to Coda Radio, you know I wrote a, let's call it prototype version in mono mm. that wasn't very good. <laughs> Why, because of mono or just because? I'm going to say because of mono. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go because of mono. Oh, okay, because all right. It's an answer I like better. Now, it's a mono um, for the desktop. You know, yeah. Miguel de Acasa, that whole community has kind of gone towards the Zemirian way of doing things, and they're focusing on mobile. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's really not a strong platform. Yeah, definitely not for desktop Linux anymore. Um, currently, what I was going to talk about, actually, if you tune into Coderado tomorrow, I'm actually moving it to QT. You are? Yeah, Interesting. Hmm. I wanted something low level that can actually run on. Pretty much everything, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. If, if you're not familiar, with Qt is actually C plus hmm. plus. And we just covered the story at the top of the show. They just got a good. They just got uh, purchased by uh, Digia, who seems to be a, a friend to Qt. So the the Qt platform uh, could have some serious legs. I hope so. But they also mentioned uh, adapting it for mobile, and that's yeah. kind of what they did with Mono. Yeah. So I, yeah. I hope that doesn't happen. Well, as long as they keep the desktop version strong, I suppose. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that'll be interesting. So we're going to chat about that tomorrow, huh? Yeah, we are. All right, sir. Well, uh, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. And uh, people, you could you got to catch Dakota Radio if you haven't watched it yet. Uh, it is a great chat show that Michael and I do every Monday. We do it 9 a.m. Pacific live over jblive.tv, but then it's released for download a couple of hours after that. All right, Michael. Well, thanks. And that brings us to the end of this week's broadcast. Now, you can find the link to vote in the show notes. We'll be giving it out to the chat room a little bit after the show, so that way they will get the first voting, but I want to get all of you guys to watch this episode to go vote, and then at the end of next week's episode, we'll review the results. So uh, Get out there and vote. Your vote counts. Find a link in the show notes for that. And thank you again to Michael for coming on. Now, Matt, Appreciate that. let's do a little bit of feedback before let's we Let's do some feedback. On. Let's first see what we got. email comes in from Scott, and he wrote All to right. uh, Linux Action Show at JupiterBroadcasting.com and said, Chris or Matt, have you ever used Reaper at Reaper.fm? Mm-hmm. It's a Windows multi-track recorder, but it works great under Wine. Um, and uh, it's a so it's, I've heard of it, but I've never used it personally. It's, it's mm-hmm. like it's like it's like Adur, it's like okay. Audition. It's not right. like Audacity. It's a multi-track right, recorder. Right, right, much more advanced. And you okay. know what? I downloaded it, the Windows executable, mm-hmm. installed it in Wine, ran just great. No tweaking, no, no nothing. Wow, no nothing. Wow. Um, I I huh. don't I didn't play with it long enough to come away with a really informed opinion on whether mm-hmm. it'd be worth doing this. I would be nervous doing like podcast production in something that's running through Wine, just because you never know, right? Whereas something like Ardour is native. However. For like the 15 minutes that I played with this thing, I was very impressed with the application and its design. It was very nice. Uh, hmm. and, that's uh, interesting. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, well, it's uh, an option. You know, I, I think that's pretty cool. So apparently, yeah, there you go. So there you go. So yes, yeah. I have tried Reaper Scott, and it was great. Now, uh, Namaya? Namaya? Yeah, I'm going to say Namaya. Namaya? Okay. Yeah. He, he writes in with concerns regarding the clangs. His last show, you mentioned the Phronix clang post, but I suggest you review the reaction from the Ardour maintainer and the Jack Audio contributor, Paul Davis. Mm. Ah, they have some concerns about mm-hmm. it. Uh, he says, also consider the writer, Datton Wolf, of this uh, prematurely announced project. Now, this is coming from Namaya, so I'm not sure, but he says mm-hmm. that he wasn't ready for it to be announced yet. It kind of oh. The article kind of got published before they were really ready for the, oh, no. for the world to see it. Yeah, see, and I wondered about that. Yeah. Uh, you go on, yeah, that was something that, yeah. yeah. You go on to read here, and it says, mm-hmm. uh, this is, uh, 
uh, from one of the uh, either the mm. Jack Audio or our door contributor. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. He says uh, good quality sound mixing requires floating point operations, but that's not allowed in the kernel currently. How can um, this be fixed? Right. So if yeah, you're really the kernel, yeah, right, right. It right. becomes a mood issue at right. that point. Yeah. Uh, Clang seems like a small step in the right direction, but this mm. is unrealistic to reinvent the wheel. How many years will this take? Right. Either enhancing also with floating point or improving OSS four and pushing it mainline is the solution. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's really what it is. It's gonna you're gonna have to work with what we have for now. Interesting and, uh, to see know. that. I thought maybe Clang might be coming in with open arms, but it would seem to be a little yeah. controversy. It, it, Linux sound never gets gets away just uh, without any controversy. All yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those things. Kevin writes in with a question for us, Matt. Let's All see right. if we can't answer it. He says, How, what's the best way to get media on the Raspberry Pi? Hey, Chris and Matt, I was hoping to get my home set up hmm. for my Raspberry Pi before it gets there. He's ordered it, and now he's waiting 11 weeks. I want to mm-hmm. use it to play media on my TV, as I'm sure mm-hmm. there's a lot of other people that do, too. The problem is I don't want to store the media on my Raspberry Pi, as I'm sure, sure the uh, one terabyte SD card I would require would be very expensive. <laughs> right. I would much terrible. prefer to have my media in a RAID. Uh, on my home server. The problem is I don't want to use something like FileZilla to transfer the files. I'd rather just stream them to my Raspberry Pi. Is this impossible? Thanks in advance. So it seems like hmm. he's kind of starting down the right track yeah. with, with um, you know, thinking home server. Oh, yeah, no, versus trying to attach something lo- locally. Uh, you know, what he yeah. didn't say is if he got the Raspberry Pi with the Ethernet adapter. That kind of matters. Yeah. I'm going to assume he did, though. I would hope so. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, maybe you could use a USB Wi-Fi dongle. But uh, what I would yeah. look into are two things. Number one, get a distro. There's there's Xbox Media Center distros that we've linked to yeah. in the show notes that go. are built for the Raspberry Pi. Mm-hmm. Use one of those. And then uh, you could either do a Samba connection back to like a free NAS box, you know, or a mm-hmm. ready NAS, whatever you're yeah. using. Yeah. Uh, but if you just have a PC that you just want to throw some disks in, you could use Open Filer or my favorite, free NAS. Yeah, that which, could work. I'd... And then, uh, or, you know, just any kind of Linux box and then throw something on there like PS3 Media Server. Have you ever used PS3 Media Server? I have not. It is... Uh, it is a, a little Java app that you run, and you point it at a directory. It indexes okay. all the videos in that directory, and then it listens for co- incoming connections mm-hmm. on the port that the PS3 broadcasts for. So, like, the PS3 will go out and do, like, a discovery of media servers on your home network, and this will be automatically discovered by your PS3 media server. And then, when you go in there, it'll list all of the thumbnails, but it also can provide okay. streaming for other streaming type yeah. You know, like I think it's just DLNA or well, something. Well, that's pretty so. cool. Yeah, I mean, as far as like what I was gonna, what I would run on a Pi if I had one myself, I know that they make XBMC for it. Um, that would be my first stop, just because of the fact that I'm most familiar with it. Uh, and then, of course, yeah, I think just running a file server on a separate computer, yeah, and just going with that. Yeah, you know, totally. Um, easy. I guess. So. Oh wow. Oh wow. Okay. I see. Mm. Paul, here's Paul Davis the, the uh, chat from the uh, last email. There is a very very long thread wow. in here about all the holy crap wall of text. Yes, yeah, so you guys check out if you're interested in this topic. I won't I won't read it all because I don't know how no. many people are actually interested in it. But uh, boy, it looks like the Linux audio thing. Not to jump check, around. But. Check it out. Now, Matt, crazy. crazy. Before we get out of here, I thought it'd be kind of neat to tell people a little bit about uh, some what you do during the uh, week when you're not here on the show. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I uh, write for datamation.com. These are the guys behind uh, such the things as internet.com and other sites you've probably have heard of. They are a major, major player in that space. And I actually write for the open source department for Datamation. So you can check out some what I, what I write. And usually when I'm writing something, I try to steer it in the what ifs or the wouldn't it be interestings or kind I'm not convinced of this. Idea. Yeah. But kind of noodle Ask something a little question. more. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Noodle on something. I like little. you have a uh, three top. Ubuntu Alternatives article that you published on uh, yes. the 7th. Which, uh, yeah, one is the expected Linux Mint. I mean, these are obviously going to be based on Ubuntu, but there are other alternatives. And yeah. We've got Pear and... Uh, good article. You know, good good stuff. Yeah, and uh, you can check that out. Link in the show notes to uh, Matt's recent post. And, uh, of course, you can also find a link in there to the jblive.info mm-hmm. radio page. That's the 24-7 radio stream that Jupiter Broadcasting does now. Yeah. Last Saturday, I tried an experiment I'd like to get some feedback on. Oh, oh, and mm. I also have a, I have, a, I have a remote desktop question, too, I want to ask. Oh, yeah. But the experiment I tried is Saturday, I played a bunch of old-time radio mystery theater stuff, like mm-hmm. CBS Radio Theater and Mystery Theater and, and Sherlock Holmes stuff and all that kind of stuff. Sure. So that, that was going on Saturday on the, on the live stream, but usually it's, it's a combination of Creative Commons music and podcasts from around the community. Oh, okay. And uh, our back catalog and things like that. So you can find that over at jblive.info. Link in the show notes. Before we go, this will be the real test to see who's stuck around this long. I am looking to do a really good segment on built-in remote desktop. So Matt did uh, a remote desktop Mm -hmm. for like using Chrome, right, Mm -hmm. to remote control a machine. I'm looking for something that's kind of like VNC. 
mm-hmm. where I have on this machine here, for example, I have Gnome's built-in remote desktop capability. We go in there, you turn it right. It's I forget it's V something. V. It sucks. Yeah. The server sucks. Yeah. When I connect to it with a remote VNC client, I get like no screen updates. I don't know if it's because I'm using Compiz with Unity. I assume so. I want to figure out what is the dead simple like install a package, turn it on, mm-hmm. and now you get remote access to the screen of your machine. I would right. like people to send in their recommendations to Linux Action Show, JupiterBroadcasting.com, or use the contact form or submit it to the Reddit so other people can vet it as well. That would be interesting. The, yeah. Uh, over at the Check Linux that Action out. Subreddit. I would be, like to know if we get some good submissions, I'll uh, do a roundup of them here on the show. Yeah, I think that'd be great. Because I'll tell you, I was setting this up for, uh, I was setting up Light Reader on this machine from my office and, you know, outside the studio. Mm. And uh, what a pain in the butt. I just right. couldn't believe how bad. The remote screen stuff has gotten. Just yeah, it, it usually starts off pretty smooth, and then it starts kind of yeah. delaying, yeah, you know, to the point where it's just locked up and terrible. So yeah, an X server is being suggested already, and I'm not rejecting an X server, but I really like the idea of something that captures the current session, so that way I could walk right. away from the machine right. and then connect back in and do something. Like what I want to do, for example, is I want to do like some encoding out here. To, I'm going to want to play with making WebM versions, but I want to be able to work in my office, and then when the file's ready, just VNC in and activate it. Yeah. But it would seem with Unity and Compass or whatever it is, it's just totally, it's a butt experience. But I, I think it's more, I think it's the protocol, honestly. I, I honestly do. I think, I th- I've never had, the, I've never been that impressed with VNC to begin with. Uh, no, I think uh, I've had some good luck with X forwarding, uh, yeah. things of that sort. I, yep. It's better. Um, yep. It depends on where you're connecting to, obviously. And yeah, yeah. And <laughs> but, if you're yeah. okay with starting a new session and launching a new version. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not, it's not that clean, but it works. Sure. Uh, you could always just use the good old command line too. Right? You could, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You could do that. You could All do right. That. Well, so, uh, yeah, sure. Man, I think that's the whole show. Let's let, let's wrap this thing All up. Right. Now uh, we are live Sundays at 10 a.m. Mm-hmm. Pacific over at jblive.tv, and you can join our awesome chat room and tell us about stuff as we're going. And of course, the show is available for download just a few hours afterwards in just about any format you could ever possibly want, except for um, WebM. But I'm experimenting. Or real player. Well, I don't think. But no, I said want. Oh, Remember that was the, I oh the that's the emphasis. Yeah. I, I found something of mine on a player not too long ago, so yeah. <laughs> All, right, yeah. Uh, All right, everyone. All right. Thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. And we'll be right back here next week. Here we go. It is the rap segment in three and two. And I want, I want every dialog box to be clickable or uh, to be arrow keyed and hot keyable. If, if my mouse were to die, I should be able to make it the entire day. <laughs>